So you fully expected, because you'd paid the money, to get the airplane? Oh, yes. I, I mean, in fact, I definitely had the airplane. Uh, I had pulled him out of jail on a $30,000 bail, and I flew with him to Nassau to pick up the airplane. Okay. But you didn't get the airplane? Uh, no, sir. I did not get the airplane. And what happened? Uh, at the last minute, uh, there was a, a letter from the uh, U.S. ambassador uh, telling customs and the magistrate, actually, uh, to consider the fact that airplane belonged to some pharmaceutical company in Atlanta and to please do everything in their power to have that airplane return uh, to the United States. Okay. Uh, to his and the airplane home. was returned? As far as I know, yes, sir. Okay. Now, uh, coming back to the question Senator McConnell was asking about interdiction, uh, Do you think, is interdiction a good law enforcement? I mean, you're sitting there, you make plans to run in, you've got airplanes, you know the islands, you know how to get the drugs in and out. If you're sitting there today and you know that we've got these interdiction forces there, yes, sir. Uh, given the current level of the force and the current efforts, would you still decide to go ahead and run drugs in? Yes, sir. As long as I have the Bahamian as a uh, aircraft carrier, I will. Why is that? Um, first of all, you have protection. You have a place where you're only 50 miles away, and uh, no matter what happens, if somebody's chasing you up there 30 miles out in the ocean, uh, and you see him coming, uh, you can turn around and head back into the islands, and of course you're paying for protection, they're going to protect you. And when you say protect you, that means that if you get arrested, what happens to you? Um, not in the Bahamas, sir. Not if you pay, you won't get arrested. I mean, they, you know, they just turn their backs or whatever. But some people do get arrested, right? Yes, sir. What happens, what happens to the people who get arrested? Uh, in my times, uh, you just pay uh, bail. You know, you bail out and you leave. You don't go to jail? No, sir. You don't get prosecuted? No. And is that, is that understood? Is that known before you enter into these? Uh... Yes, sir. Now, for instance, uh, let me tell you, in 1982, by uh, mistake, by an error, uh, five of my people got arrested, like I say, by, completely by mistake. And uh, they all left jail. Nobody was sentenced. They were all acquitted. It did cost me $250,000, though. It cost you two hundred and fifty thousand. In fact, two hundred seventy-two thousand dollars, to be exact. Who'd you pay that to? A lawyer, a Bahamian lawyer. Okay. Has the new equipment and the radar helped at all? The new equipment and radar that the U.S. has—we hear a lot about it. We've got this big new radar and everything. Does that make a difference? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He has made a, a difference, uh, but I still hear from my old pilot friends that. Sometimes they can go around it. When you were in the business, how did you handle your cash? Oh, just keep it in a suitcase or uh, somewhere, different family members I will give them to hold it for me. Well, was there a point where you had an enormous collection of cash in your house? Yes, sir. Do you want to describe that? Well, there were many times that uh, we were counting money. I wouldn't bother with the $5 bills or $1 bill. We'll give it to somebody that goes out and get beer or something as a gift. Uh, money will be uh, in my living room, which is about 24 by 24 or something like that. It's a good part of it will be up to your ankles. The money will be up to your ankles when you step on it. In this living room? Yeah. And what would you do with the money? Well, pay people off, you know, pay everybody off, and then uh, well, buy things, suspend it. What about the money you kept for yourself? What did you do with that? You obviously weren't just in the business of giving it away. Uh, maybe that's the reason why I was in the business for uh, continuous years, and nothing ever happens to me. Uh, 
I did. I didn't retire with as much money as I would have liked to. Did um, you ship some suitcases to certain places? Yes, sir. Yeah. Panama. Panama. It's a, a very good place to launder money. Panama. Yes, sir. And you just take these suitcases and ship them. How would you get them down there? Uh, I paid. I believe it was ten percent. Ten percent of whatever I was shipping, I was paying to. Uh, a fellow who, by the way, is in jail right now, uh, would make the arrangements. Where was this fellow? In Miami. Okay. Uh, he will not only take my money, he will take money from any other dopers. Uh, I believe uh, one time when he was arrested, he, was, he had like $5 million in a Lear jet ready to be flown back to Panama. And he was taking it down to Panama? Yes, sir. Was I did Pan take some money myself to Panama one time. You took your... I'm sorry, you... I did took some money myself to Panama. Was Panama the principal place where you deposited or laundered money? The Bahamas also. Okay. Now, have you ever talked to Gorman Bannister before yes, meeting sir. here today? Yes, sir. Can you describe how you have known Mr. Bannister, Gorman Bannister? Well, I met Mr. Bannister uh, about a month ago five weeks ago or so. My, uh, yeah, uh, first week of April in Miami. Uh, I didn't know the gentleman personally, but I did know his father, who I did business with. And who is his father? Uh, Mr. Everett Bannister. Where did he live? Uh, as far as I know, in the Bahamas right now. And what dealings did you have with Mr. Bannister? Uh, I gave Mr. Bannister $20,000, that was a 10% down payment of a $200,000 uh, deal. Uh, that included taking me off the stop list or restricted list, and also to make things much easier for me to operate. The way he put it, uh, instead of getting protection from halfway, let's get protection from the top. What were the circumstances of your meeting Mr. Gorman Bannister, who is here? Um, I, I guess that the reason for it was, not that I guess, I'm positive, a journalist friend of mine uh, told me that Mr. Bannister was coming over to uh, talk to him and, uh, uh, you know, I told him I was interested in meeting him and uh, he wanted me to meet him also because I guess he makes good copy, uh, the son of a businessman in the Bahamas who could fix things in the next doper and uh, we got to know each other and uh, I think I'm instrumental in having Mr. Bannister sitting where he is right now. When Mr. Bannister first came to you, did you question his credibility? Well, when I first uh, met him, of course, uh, you know, you have to be a little reluctant to who he is and what is he doing and you know, I, would, I guess I'll do the same thing with anybody that I meet for the first time. Did you do anything special to try to test his credibility, to tell whether he was coming straight to you? Yes, yes, I did. Without his knowledge, I guess I did. What did you do? Well, like, uh, uh, you know, I would be asking certain questions that I spoke to his father about, uh, uh, why did his father uh, came to me, and he did come up with the right answers, and in fact, one time, uh, without not being my intentions, we driving up uh, where I used to live in, in, uh, in Miami, and there was uh, three buildings almost equally exactly alike, and uh, he picked out the right one, where I used to live, because he dropped his father there one time. And when his father had been dropped there, was that when you had paid his father money? Uh, no, it was a former uh, son-in-law of mine who was paying. I was not happened to be uh, at home at that moment, but my son-in-law was. Do you know whether or not Cuba has been active in supporting drug smugglers? I, I think so. For the rumors that I hear, and it's all over Miami. Yes, sir, it is very active right now. But you say by rumors? Well, you hear things on the street. You know, people using Cuba as a, a transshipment point, and uh, I would say using Cuba 
same as the Bahamas, not as openly, of course. Did you ever use Cuba? No, sir. I was in Cuba in 1979, and uh, I was offered that if I could want it, I could. You were offered to use Cuba? Yes, sir. Oh, personally? Personally, yes. Sir. Have you talked with people that you know personally who have used Cuba? Uh, at the beginning, 1979, 1980, I did spoke to a couple of people that have used Cuba as a refueling point, uh, uh, having a little protection from the weather, uh, you know, while they're coming in from uh, from Colombia. And you say this is on the street, so to speak, in Miami? Yes, sir. The rumors are there, definitely. Well, I think it's something that we obviously will want to explore and see if we can get a better handle on it as we go along here. Uh, which islands did you uh, operate from in the Bahamas? Oh, I just about every one that there was a strip in it. Oh, no. in Why did port. you move from one island to another? Uh, well, uh, let's say the competition will come in and start operating one island and they will do th certain things wrong like uh, plane coming in and crash landing or uh, uh, people getting drunk out in the street or <coughs> using their own product, and uh, the place would get hot. Now, I, I, I was not just about to go ahead and pull an Al Capone or anything like that and start shooting people, so the best way is to move away. And uh, being the, that I had almost uh, accessibility to any island in the Bahamas, because I was very well known, I could operate just about any place. Did you know a smuggler named George Morales? Yes, sir. Mr. Morales made his first trip uh, uh, of uh, grass, marijuana, with uh, a plane that was, he rented from me. And do you know why he got caught? Well, it was a matter of time whether Mr. Morales was going to get caught by our own law enforcement or he was going to get killed by somebody. Uh, but I do know that uh, he made quite a few mistakes. And uh, um, even though I know the man and I don't have any animosity towards him, I should, but I don't. Uh, uh, I think he made too many mistakes. I, I don't think he was a real professional. Uh, Mr. Garcia, let me ask you, you, you talk about uh, some of these folks playing pretty rough. It's a known fact within the drug world and law enforcement community that uh, indeed it uh, is a world in which people get killed, uh, uh, and many have. Here you are testifying openly. You've testified in court before, have you not? Yes, sir. Uh, you don't worry about your own safety? Yes, I, I'd be lying if I say that I don't, but uh, I try not to think about it. I've been threatened, like I said before in my statement, several times. Okay. Mr. McConnell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A couple more questions. Uh, if we were to shut the Bahamas down, in your judgment, where would the smugglers go? I think that if I were a regular smuggler, if I were smuggling now, uh, first of all, I would stop to begin with. I wouldn't go anyplace else. I would stop doing it right then and there. I pick up my marbles and leave. But knowing these people and how greedy they can be and you know, how stupid some of them can be, most of them, I would go to Mexico. Mexico then would be more inviting than Cuba. Uh, well, are we talking about different type of smugglers? I'm, I'm, see, I'm relating to the Cuban smugglers that I know. And uh, one of the reasons they are in Miami is because they can't take communists. So, uh, like the guy that I used to work for at the beginning when I started on it, uh, uh, the offer to operate out of Cuba was made to me for me to relate it to him because I was his right hand man. And he says, no way, I will never deal with communists, not even to smuggle drugs. Uh, but I would say some of them Anti-communist smugglers don't want to deal with Cuba then, right? Uh, Cubans, I would say. <laughs> So your feeling is that, that Mexico would be a, uh, a place where, where smugglers could um, operate? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. For they, the same they kinds do of, now. They do now. For, for the same kinds of reasons that uh, smugglers can operate in, in, uh, in the Bahamas? Uh, correct. Uh, 
Are for there protection for? Uh, is that happening now? The way, yes, sure. You mentioned Panama. You mentioned uh, Cuba. We've talked about the Bahamas, and you've mentioned Mexico. Are there other countries in oh. that area? Dominican Republic is coming around pretty good now. So you could also operate there with relative impunity for a price? Yes, sir. Are there other countries? Jamaica. Jamaica, you can operate in Jamaica. There's no, no problem, except that you have the island of Cuba in between and you have to go around it. So, uh, you know, it's, it's almost, uh, almost the same distance if you're coming in from uh, the north coast of uh, Colombia. So since you don't put much uh, faith in our ability to deal with this problem very significantly from an, interdic from an interdiction point of view, uh, to have any real impact on, on, on the matter, we're going to have to have some kind of multi multilateral cooperative agreement with a variety of different countries to have any impact on this problem. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir, but not only in that particular area. I think, uh, I think the war against drugs, it's, uh, it's got several fronts. And there's no question about it. That's one of the most important ones. But that's not the only one. You do need interdiction. You, you, you have to deal with these countries that, you know, allows their officials to be bribed and so forth. Uh, you have to deal with the economics of it. And, and I think it's very important that finally it starts happening in here. You have to deal with educating the American people and the young people to yeah, say no to drugs. That's what I was going to ask you. That, that, that's the one thing we haven't talked about. Uh, how significant an impact on this whole problem could we have in this country with our educational efforts and, and simply uh, um, trying to encourage people to, to, to not use this product, to do something on the, on the demand end, end of it? That's right, sir. Is that, a, is that a good place to be spending a lot of our resources in this country? I would say uh, yes. Is that more productive? Yes. It is. It is uh, education. It's it's one of the major fronts in this war. If you if you were slicing up the uh, the the anti-drug uh, dollars, uh, would you put more into education than you would into interdiction, for example? No, I think you got to have both of them. You got to have both of them. Uh, but I would say that the effort on on education is is not only up to the federal government. I think it's up to the communities themselves. Uh, but you do have to have interdiction, and, and you do have to deal with this countries now. What uh, I don't know if everybody is aware of what's happening in Miami now uh, with our city of Miami Police Department, which almost the entire night shift uh, has been found, or it's going to be found, or to be corrupt and all kind of crimes. The only reason for that. Uh, is because of the drug problems that we have. Uh, I would not say that there will never be a crooked cop or, or somebody that goes out and rob a bank, even though he's a policeman. It, it we're always going to have that. But the main reason that there is such a huge amount of uh, corruption, uh, not only in the police department, but in our own society in Miami, is because of uh, you know, where we're located geographical, in front of the Bahamas. The Bahamas is there. Uh, drug coming to the Bahamas on a, like I say, is just as busy as Miami International Airport. And then he comes into Miami. Finally, Mr. Garcia, given how profitable this business is, why did you get out? Uh, many people have asked me that question. I've tried to answer it myself. Uh, first of all, I, I saw certain things on a uh, 13-year-old boy that I have, my only son. I do have other daughters, but he's the only male. And uh, I just didn't like it. I didn't like the way he was uh, taking this thing. And, uh, you know, uh, I didn't like to uh, be dealing with the same people, constantly uh, talking the same language, uh, not being able to read a book, because if you read a book, uh, what are you doing, Kojak? You're not thinking about drugs anymore? And, uh, people using drugs. Uh, it was a combination of many things. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to be a hypocrite and say that I found God. I think I found God when I was born, uh, or anything like that. It's just that I, it's just that I got disgusted with the whole thing, and I was pretty much aware that what may happen to 
and what was happening to my own family, I uh, just two months ago, um, I had a very bad personal experience. Uh, I lost a cousin, a girl, 32 years of age, uh, stabbed to death in Miami 16 times uh, by a uh, by another drugger that uh, was using the drugs, crack, by the way, both of them. And uh, he just took a knife and a stabber. Uh, a year ago, I lost a son-in-law in New York City uh, by an overdose, 32, 31 years of age. Uh, right now, one of my grandchildren, my first grandchildren, who is uh, 18, uh, we're having a lot of problems with him. So. I'm talking by experience, personal experience. I saw all that coming, and I figured before it got any worse. Yeah. And not only did I get out of it, I think I have done uh, just about anything anybody can do, be here, for instance, try to fight this evil. Uh, not only in the States, I have done it in Europe. Uh, anybody, anywhere would I've been asked to help. I've done it, and even on my own expense. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Mr. Garcia, can you put a value?